Hey what is up YouTube, it's your boy Terrence and I'm back at it with a new video. Happy New Year to you. I'm not even going to talk about my hiatus right now because I've been off YouTube for a while. I'm hoping I can stay consistent this time around. For this video I'm going to be making this what you see here on screen. This is Zelda's logo animation from the Tears of the Kingdom's third trailer. It's not the exact same thing, actually I think I kind of improved on it as you can see here. So Nintendo, don't come after me. With that, let's get right into the video. Also, I have project files in the description that you can download to follow along. So my first step for this video was to get an image of the logo. I upscaled it with AI, then I started separating everything in Photoshop. I also started recreating bits and pieces that were missing, like the parts of the green thing that's obstructed by the text, and the tip part of the sword that's at the bottom. I'm not showing any of that in this tutorial because that's Photoshop, but once I was done, I have all of these pieces. I rasterized all the layers and saved it out as a PSD. I went to the file menu, imported the file. Then I organized my flow. I like when it flows vertically like it would in Nuke. I added a background node and turned the alpha down to zero. I'm going to be using this as a canvas essentially. I'm now adding my first transform node to the circle thing so I can start animating. Just a quick tip, if you're wondering how I'm adding nodes this quickly, I installed this plugin named Reactor. Inside Reactor you have this add-on named Nuke Diffusion and what this does essentially is it gives you some Nuke shortcuts so I can simply press T to add a transform node. And if you're wondering what that little square is, it's called a pipe router. Like the name suggests, it allows me to route the lines from node to node. On PC you hold the Alt key and click on the line, on Mac you hold Command. Now back to the video. My first step was playing with the pivot parameter for the green ring. Since the pivot is not in the dead center of the ring, it was rotating kind of weird. So with some trial and error, I got the pivot to work more like I wanted it. With that, I set my first keyframe on the angle property, and I started playing with the animation curves in the spline editor. My intention here is to have the animation start off, build up some speed, and then come to a very slow stop. I already have a video out explaining how to use a spline editor, the keyframe editor, and how to do basic animations inside of Fusion. If you don't understand anything that you're seeing here, I recommend watching that tutorial first, then coming back to this one. You can find it linked above at the top right or in the description. Here I realized that I had it rotating the wrong direction, so I simply flipped the curve and readjusted the handle. With the ring animation done, I reorganized my flow by moving things up and adding pipe routers. This just makes things a little cleaner so I can easily follow the flow. Here I'm merging everything over that alpha background that I created earlier. To reveal the text like Nintendo did here, you could employ a few different methods. For example, you could use the image texture, and you can get as elaborate as you'd like. But in my case, I decided on using a fast noise texture. I played around with the parameters until I found something that kind of matched the texture that was used in the original video. This is really a trial and error process, nothing here is really set in stone. You just mess around with it until you find something that you like. I then set a keyframe on the seeth value, which is pretty much like the turbulence for the noise texture. I then move forward in time to where the text reveal should end, and set another keyframe and just change the value. That way the noise texture stays moving the entire time. Here I realized that the texture was moving a little bit too slow, so I grabbed the keyframe in the spline editor and just moved it up so I can get things moving a bit faster. Here I'm attaching the fast noise to the blue input on the merge, that way I can use it as a mask. The white will reveal the text and the black will hide it. The second I connect the node, you can already see it affecting the text. Since the fast noise is constantly moving and never turning fully white, it will never reveal the text in its entirety. Plus I wanted to have a bit more control, so I brought in a polygon node and started drawing out this shape that I'm going to be using to drive a second mask. I attached it to the mask input on the fast noise, that way I can use this mask to animate it. I then added some feather so it doesn't have the sharp edges. To animate the mask, I select all the points on the curve, and I also click this last option to enable shape animation. What I'm doing here is scaling up the mask, setting a keyframe, and then going back in time and scaling it down. A quick shortcut tip, once you have all the points selected on the mask, you can use the T key to rotate, the S key to scale, and you can use the Alt key on Windows to move. I played around with the noise texture just a little bit more so I can add some smaller details before I moved on to the next step. Like I mentioned before, the noise mask is never going to fill the text out entirely, so what I'm doing here is adding in a bitmap node. What the bitmap node does is it allows you to use one or more images as a mask. If I was simply using shape nodes as a mask, I could stack them, but in this case I want to use the noise and the background node. 
You can see that earlier I duplicated a polygon node. I'm taking it off here so I can use it with a background node. I move these things up to create some more space and I create a background node. To ensure that the mask works as it did on the fast noise, I have to make the background node the same size. In this case, it's 2999 by 1731. If the resolution is not correct, the mask is going to be too big, too small, or it's going to be squashed or stretched. Now that that's done, I merge the two nodes and connect it to the bitmap. Now that I have a fully white mask, the text can be revealed in its entirety. But I still want to see the jagged look from the fast noise mask. So to achieve this, what I'm going to be doing is offsetting the keyframes for the second polygon that I created. So it's going to start a bit later. And as you can see, it'll be revealed with the jagged mask. Then the second mask is going to scale up, revealing all the text without any holes. For the glow animation, I add a glow node to the text. I start playing with the glow size and the glow parameter until I get something that I like. For the glow animation, my plan is to have it start with a bright glow. Then I decrease that glow but not turn it off entirely. I set a third keyframe to hold that glow on that level for a while. Then I raise the glow high again once all the text has been revealed. And then over time, I just have it lower until the glow is almost turned off. I'm doing all this in the spline editor and I'm hitting the S key on some of the keyframes to smooth out the animation curve. Here's a quick tip from editor me. If you're working on something inside of Fusion that you want to play back and it's not playing in real time on your system, what you can do is right click on the node that you want to play, go to create slash play preview on. You can do the left or the right viewer. I get this pop-up window asking me to select a few options. I can choose high quality, the resolution, stuff like that, and I can hit start render. This will then render out the node that you have selected play this back you can't just hit the play that's on the timeline what you have to do is right click in the viewer and hit play and it will play it back in real time you could also right click and hit loop you can hit ping pong full screen once you're done you can drag the node back to the viewer or you can hit one or two on the keyboard if you want to do this a bit faster you can hold the alt key or the command on mac and drag it to the window that you want to play the preview in but to do it even a bit quicker and for this option i got some help from a reddit viewer named just crop it so shout out to just crop it you can hold the shift and the alt key or command on mac and then drag it to the viewer once you release it's going to go ahead and start rendering without showing the window it's going to use the last settings that you selected let's say you want to render only a part of this video what you can do is select the portion that you need so let's say from frame 43 to frame 70 and I'm doing this by holding the control key on the computer. Just dragging. Shift Alt, drag it to a viewer, release. And it renders out only what's in that range. Like in play. There we go. Once you're done, you can hold control and double click the timeline to have it remove the in and out points. All right, back to the video. Here I'm just moving around some keyframes so I can retime the animation. And once I have something that I like, I work with it. Now it's time to start animating the sword. After finding where I want to put my first keyframe, I add a transform node after the sword. You can see me moving the pivot point over to the sword. This is usually good practice if there's some scaling or rotation involved, but in this case it wasn't necessary, but I did it anyway. I wanted the sword to end its animation right when the glow was at the strongest point. That's around frame 40, so I placed the keyframe. Then I went back up the timeline to frame 25, which is where I wanted the sword animation to start. Using the inspector, I moved the sword back upwards. Then over in the spline editor, I adjusted the curves to get the animation that I like. Like with most things when it came to animation, I had to move the keyframes around a little bit so I can get some timing that I like. Here I'm attaching the output from the fast noise to the sword, that way I can have the sword not be visible on screen at all the time. A bit of the sword handle was still missing so I copied the polygon node that I made above and using a bitmap, I extended the mask just a little bit more. I could have done this with a new custom polygon but I already created something so I just reused it. I copied the glow node that I made for the Zelda text and pasted that on the sword. I then made a new polygon node because I didn't want the sword to come out on the other end. I wanted the real master sword to be on one side and the zone eye blade on the other. I connected that to the merge, effectively masking my sword. 
Now it's time to animate the Zonai blade. For this one I copied the transform node that I used for the sword and pasted it here. It's using the same animation, the same timing and everything, it wouldn't make sense to recreate this animation. I made a polygon node for the Zonai blade because I want it to be at the bottom of the Z but not at the top. Connected that and we're in business. At this point I decided to remove the entire section for the Zelda text because I wanted it to be its own thing. I made a background node, made it alpha, and I merged the Zelda text over that background so no longer is it merged over the nodes that came above it, it's now merged over this transparent background. I then took all that and merged it in front of the nodes that came before it. I did this because I wanted an easy way to create a mask that I can cut through the Z. I made two quick polygon masks roughly in the shape of the Zonai sword and just animated it going through the Z the same time the Zonai sword is going through. That way I can make a cutout. I set them both to invert, that way we see everything that's outside of the mask. And now we have the Zonai blade slicing through the Z. I copied the glow node again from the Zelda text over to the Zonai sword. Then I adjusted the curves in this planet editor so I can get the glow just right. Now it was on to the Tears of the Kingdom text. This took some trial and error. After playing around with a few different nodes, I decided on the dent node. Now this affected only one section at a time, and that was just the center of the text. So after messing with the properties a bit and animating something that I like, I duplicated the node and added it to both ends of the text. That way I can have it affect the entire thing. I added a rectangle mask to the Zelda text node and used that to animate from the center out. That way I reveal the text from the center. I increased the soft edge so it's faded. Now with the dent nodes and this mask animation, it looks like the text is fading in and going from a distorted look to an undistorted look. I copied over my famous glow animation, adjusted the keyframes, and now we're cooking with fire. My next step is adding a lens flare. Now I could have gone all out, get elaborate, create a whole lens flare and everything, but I wanted something simple. Now there's this lens flare that I've been using in still images for years, it's one of my favorite lens flares. A little backstory, this lens flare is from psdbox.com, shout out to psdbox if you're interested in photo manipulation then you should definitely check this stuff out. In my early days of photoshop, psdbox taught me all the fundamentals of image manipulation so I went, I found this lens flare, I removed the psdbox.com from the corner using a mask. Then I used an ellipse mask and scaled it up to animate the lens flare coming on. I was playing around with different blend modes like add and screen but there was nothing behind this image so it just wouldn't work. So I decided on using a luma key to remove the black background from the lens flare. I mean it wins no awards but if it works it works. At this point I decided that I was going to do something 3D at the end so I deleted that alpha background that I created at the very start that I was planning on using. I did a google search for some temple walls from Tears of the Kingdom and then I had that image upscaled with AI to 6960 by 3840. I did this so I had a really high quality image to work with in the 3D space. Just in case I wanted to get the camera close to the texture, I wouldn't see that much quality loss. I have never done a tutorial on the 3D space inside of Fusion so this will be my first time exploring that in a video. I won't be going into too much details here but I will make a future tutorial on 3D inside of Fusion. Once I do, I'll link it in the description of this video for anyone watching this tutorial after I made the future tutorial. Like you see here, to make an image 3D inside of Fusion you simply have to add an image plane and connect the image to that plane. Here I'm adding a second one and I'm going to be connecting everything that I worked on before to that plane so now I have have everything that I worked on previously as a 3D object. Just like with 2D, you can merge two nodes together using a merge node. In this case, it's a 3D merge. The difference is a 3D merge accepts more than two inputs. With a 2D merge, you have a foreground and background. With a 3D merge, you can have two, three, four, ten objects added to one merge. Like with other 3D applications, you also need a 3D camera so you can see what's in the 3D space. You also need a render node so you can render what the 3D camera is seeing back to a 2D image. So navigation. To pan around in the 3D space you hold the middle mouse key and move around. If you want to rotate your view you hold the alt key, the middle mouse key and move around. Dolly in and out you can simply use a scroll wheel. 
Now back to the 3D scene, initially everything will be in the same spot at the origin, so you can see here that I'm moving the camera out. Currently I'm viewing the render node which sees whatever the camera is seeing. With the camera in place, I now select the Zelda object and I go to the transformation tab and bring the size down just a little bit. The background is way too bright and saturated so I'm going to go up and add a color correction node. I'm simply playing with the settings until I find something that I like. Then I head back to the Zelda object and place a color correction node right before it. This way I can make changes to everything in the Zelda animation. I now need to add a vignette. And while there are many ways to do this, I like using a background node with an ellipse mask. This gives me a little bit more control. I tried dragging this out here but the image was a bit too small. Remember this temple image is 6000 something by 3000 something pixels and the background image is only 1080p by default. So I could increase the size or I could just use the merge node and make the image larger which is what I'm doing here. I'm also inverting the mask, that way you have the black on the outsides. Once I got something that I like, I go ahead and simply feather the edges. It's a game of back and forth, so I went back and moved the mask around, I changed the opacity from the merge node, and also I went back to the color corrector node and I made some changes there as well. The next step is animating the 3D camera. So on frame 1 of the timeline, I placed a keyframe on the Z parameter for transform. I moved a few frames forward to frame 9, placing another keyframe and then I dragged the camera out to where I want the end of the animation to be. Then I immediately changed my mind and dragged it out to frame 29. I then went in on the animation curves and hit S to smooth them out and then I started messing around with the handles. I wanted to have the camera start off fast and then come to a very slow stop. To achieve this I had to go in and manually adjust the handle so the animation works the way I intended. After the camera pulls back initially I wanted to continue pulling back slowly but in a linear fashion. So I clicked the animation curve adding a keyframe and simply dragged it up which allows the camera to keep going backwards once the initial animation is done. After this I played around with the background a little bit more adjusting the color correction, the vignette and the placement. Once I'm done I added a blur node so I can blur the background just a little bit. I wanted to create some separation between the foreground and the background putting the focus on the Zelda object. Once I'm done, it's time to hit render and profit. Well that marks the end of this tutorial, I sure hope you had some fun working on it. I definitely had fun making this, both the initial video and the tutorial. I'm not quite sure what my next video is going to be, but if you want to see something you can sound off in the comments. I plan on doing something 3D inside of Fusion but I'm not sure just yet. But the comment section is open, let's chat, let's have a discussion and I'll see you guys in the next video. Don't forget to like and subscribe, it's your boy Terrence and I'm out. Peace.